Hey folks, welcome back. In this video, we're going to go over exactly what you need to know and be able to do for the Particles and Waves Part 2 topic in the Higher Physics exam. So let's get started. Now remember the SQA split the Particles and Waves topic into 8 key areas or 8 subtopics. And in this video, we're going to focus on the last 3 key areas. But remember you can go back and watch the What You Should Know video for Particles and Waves Part 1 to cover the first 5 key areas. So for this Particles and Waves Part 2 topic, we're going to cover Spectra, we'll then look at Interference, and then we'll finish by looking at refraction of light. So firstly for spectra, you should know the Bohr model of the atom and know of the terms ground state, energy levels, ionization and zero potential energy in relation to the Bohr model of the atom. So remember Bohr's model of the atom shows a central nucleus surrounded by circular orbits. And these circular orbits represent energy levels, where the energy level closest to the nucleus is called the ground state. And we can also draw some excited states which are higher energy levels, followed by the ionization level, which is the level that electrons need to be in in order to leave the atom, so the atom becomes ionized. And at the ionization level, remember we have zero potential energy, i.e. zero joules. And remember electrons can only occupy these discrete energy levels, they can't exist between the levels, and we therefore say the energy of these electrons is quantized. Moving on, you need to know of the mechanism of production of line emission spectra, continuous emission spectra and absorption spectra in terms of electron energy level transitions. So remember electron energy level transitions are basically just where we take our circular orbits from the Bohr model of the atom and we draw them as straight lines in a kind of ladder shape with horizontal lines stacked on top of each other. And we can look at how electrons move up the energy levels and down these energy levels. And remember we get line emission spectra from electrons dropping down energy levels to release photons Photons. And on the other hand, we get absorption spectra when atoms absorb photons of light and that causes electrons to move up energy levels. Moving on, it says to use appropriate relationships to solve problems involving energy levels and the frequency of the radiation that is emitted or absorbed. So remember we can take this equation E equals HF which relates the energy of an instant photon to Planck's constant and the frequency of the instant photon and we can build on this to talk about the changing energy levels. So if we're talking about the difference between two energy levels or the change in energy levels, then we can write it as this here. So we could write E2 minus E1 is equal to HF, where E2 is just your higher energy level and E1 is just your lower energy level. But remember the subscripts don't necessarily need to be 2 and 1 here, you could be using 3 and 1 or 4 and 2, or you could just write delta E on this left hand side instead. So you could write change in energy delta E is equal to HF. Lastly for spectra, it says to know that the absorption lines, also known as Fraunhofer lines, in the spectrum of sunlight provide evidence for the composition of the sun's outer atmosphere. So this just means by looking at the spectrum of sunlight, we can tell what elements the outer atmosphere of the sun is made up of. And remember, each element has its own unique line spectrum. Next we have interference, which is the second last subtopic from the particles and waves topic. So the first statement here says to know that interference is evidence for the wave model of light. And that's opposite to the photoelectric effect providing evidence for the particle model of light. So another way of saying this is that if we spot an interference pattern, then it must be two coherent waves overlapping that is producing that interference pattern. So that tells us that light behaves as waves, not just as particles. And remember that brings in the whole idea of wave-particle duality. Next it says to know that coherent waves have a constant phase relationship. So remember that key phrase, constant phase relationship, is what you need to state if you're asked what is meant by coherent waves. And remember that also means the waves have a constant speed, frequency and wavelength. Moving on, you need to describe the conditions for constructive and destructive interference in terms of the phase difference between two waves. Well remember for constructive interference we have two waves being completely in phase, where we have a crest meeting a crest or a trough meeting a trough. However, destructive interference occurs when we have two waves meeting exactly out of phase, and that's where we have a crest meeting a trough. Next, you need to know that maxima and minima are produced when the path difference between waves is a whole number of wavelengths or an odd number of half integer wavelengths respectively. And this brings us to the equations down here. So it says use an appropriate relationship to solve problems involving the path difference between waves, wavelength and order number. So for maxima, you should know that path difference is equal to m lambda, a whole number of wavelengths. And remember that's where m is an integer, so it could take the value of 0, 1, 2 and so on. Or for minima, destructive interference, you need to remember that path difference is equal to m plus a half lambda, i.e. an odd number of half integer wavelengths where again m can be an integer 0, 1, 2 and so on. Lastly for interference you need to be able to use an appropriate relationship to solve problems involving grating spacing, wavelength, order number and angle to the maximum. So that equation remember is d sine theta equals m lambda where d is your slit separation, theta is your angle to the maximum, 
m is your order number and lambda is your wavelength. Lastly, we have refraction of light, and the first statement is to define absolute refractive index of a medium as the ratio of the speed of light in a vacuum to the speed of light in the medium. Or another way to think about that is the equation which is down here, which we can say is n equals v1 over v2, or n equals c over v, where it's the speed of light in the vacuum c divided by the speed of light in the medium v. So n equals c over v is a good way to remember that. And remember n is our absolute refractive index. Then says use an appropriate relationship to solve problems involving absolute refractive index, the angle of instance, and the angle of refraction. So we have refractive index n is equal to sine theta 1 over sine theta 2, where theta 1 is always going to be your angle in the less dense medium like air, and theta 2 is always going to be the angle in the denser medium. It then says describe an experiment to determine the refractive index of a medium. So remember to do this you would pass light from a ray box into the flat edge of a semicircular glass block, and you would change the angles of instance and measure the angles of refraction. You would then input this data to a table where you've got your angles theta1 and theta2 and then you would take the sine of each of these angles. So you do sine of theta1 and sine of theta2. If you then plot a graph of sine theta1 on the y-axis against sine theta2 on the x-axis, then you should get a straight line in your graph and the gradient of that straight line, remember, gives you the refractive index n. Moving on, you need to use appropriate relationships to solve problems involving the angles of instance and refraction the wavelength of light in each medium, the speed of light in each medium, and the frequency, including situations where light is travelling from a more dense to a less dense medium. So remember we have that refractive index n is equal to sine theta 1 over sine theta 2 from up here, but we can say that n is also equal to lambda 1 over lambda 2, where lambda 1 is the wavelength of light in the less dense medium like air, and lambda 2 is the wavelength of light in the denser medium. And we can also say that n is equal to v1 over v2, where v1 is the speed of light in air, which is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, and v2 is the speed of light in the denser medium. So we could write n equals at the start of this to show that n is equal to all of these things. And we have the wave equation here from National 5, v equals f lambda, which always comes in handy. Moving on, you should know that the refractive index of a medium increases as the frequency of instant radiation increases. So since red light has the greatest wavelength in the visible spectrum of around 700 nanometers, that means that it would have the lowest frequency, which means it would have the lowest refractive index. However, blue or violet light has a much shorter wavelength of about 400 nanometers, and therefore it's got a higher frequency than red light. So this means that the refractive index for blue or violet light will be greater than that for red light. Next, it says to define critical angle as the angle of instance which produces an angle angle of refraction of 90 degrees. And you should know that total internal reflection occurs when the angle of instance is greater than the critical angle. So if you increase your angle of instance up to the critical angle, your light's going to then refract at 90 degrees, but if you increase the angle of instance even more above the critical angle, then your light's going to be totally internally reflected and it won't leave the block. And remember total internal reflection has applications in things like fibre optic cables and diamonds. And lastly, you need to be able to use an appropriate relationship to solve problems involving critical angle and absolute refractive index. So we have that sine theta c is equal to 1 over n, where theta c is your critical angle and n is your refractive index of the material. And I should point out that refractive index, remember, is a value greater than or equal to 1 and less than 2.42, which is the highest value for diamond. And in basic terms, it gives a measure of a material's ability to refract light. So the greater the refractive index of a material, the more refraction will occur, and the smaller the refractive index of a material, the less refraction will occur. That's all for this video, folks. Thanks for watching. If you made it to the end, I really appreciate it. Make sure to give the video a like, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.